Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Cause and Journal of Statistics and Data Science Education webinar series. I'm so excited today to be talking with the authors, or two of the authors, of a recently published paper entitled The Use of Algorithmic Models to Develop Understanding of Statistical Modeling. Um, if I can get the next slide, please. Um, my name is Nick Horton, and I'm the moderator uh, for the series um, from Amherst College. Um, and I wanted to note, next slide please, that we do have a webinar scheduled coming up in May. Um, Pip Arnold and Chris Franklin will be talking about what makes a good statistical question. Um, this webinar is being recorded as are all of our webinars. Um, these get posted at that same web um, browser that you have, um, web link that, that's there. Um, and as I said, we love to kind of uh, foster conversation and other things that are going on. Next slide, please. More generally, the Consortium for the Advancement of Undergraduate Statistics Education, or CAUSE, has lots of activities that are really intended to foster professional development and to kind of really support the profession. Um, and again, this webinar series is made possible due to them. I believe that registration is now open for US COTS. It's gonna be virtual um, and it's gonna be pretty amazing. I'm pretty excited about it. Registration is only $25. And it's, um, again, please sign up now. It says open soon, but it's, but it's open at this point. Next slide, please. And I just got the announcement that the, uh, this year's uh, the round of the undergraduate statistics project competition and the research conference are both uh, available and open. And so I'd encourage people to be looking at those resources. But let me turn today to um, the kind of star attraction, which is our speakers today. Uh, next slide, please. So Andy Ziffler is a senior lecturer and researcher in the Quantitative Methods and Education Program in the Department of Educational Psychology at the University of Minnesota. Um, his scholarship focuses on statistics education and his research interests have included teacher education and how data science is transforming the curriculum. There's a lot of things he does, datadreaming.org. We'll put that into the, to the chat as a kind of a link to check out, but uh, that's Andy, one of our two speakers. Next slide. Nicola Justice studies how students and teachers learn statistics. As an assistant professor at Pacific Lutheran University, her passion is to help students develop into skillful and ethical data storytellers. And when not teaching or learning, she likes to get outside with her family, hiking, exploring, and throwing rocks in the water. So I'm going to, at this point, turn things over to Nicola and Andy to hear a little bit more of the paper. We'll have a chance for a discussion. Um, and I would encourage you to be putting um, your questions into the chat. Um, but again, take it away, Andy and Nicola. All right. Hi, welcome. I'm Andy, and uh, I am one of the uh, co-authors on uh, this paper that recently came out in um, JSDSE. I have to get used to the DS part, but it's an important part. And um, so if you want to learn more, um, or learn in more detail about any of the things that we talk about today, you're welcome to check out the paper and, um, and, and read, read further. Uh, it also probably behooves us uh, to mention that we worked on this with uh, two other co-authors, Bob Delmas and Mike Huberty, uh, both at the University of Minnesota. Mike's one of our, our graduate students there. So this, this is all based on, the idea of that, you know, modeling is an important part of statistical practice. There are many documents from all sorts of different organizations that say this is the case. And, and, and if you've taught uh, modeling, you know it's an important part of practice. And um, it's a key learning outcome that's defined for students in many of the kind of outcome documents that we have. And the way we typically approach this is through a statistical model that includes some kind of structural and random component. For instance, here is, uh, you see on the slide, we've got, um, and it also tends to kind of be incorporated with statistical inference. So we, this is the kind of the two sample t-test that uh, you might teach where we're comparing two means, whether they're equal. And so that defines a structural part. And then we put some assumptions around the errors. And throughout this, you know, statistical modeling, we we posit that it um, and taking from other people in the field that it 
there's kind of two parts of this. There's the model building, which you don't get so much of with the two sample t test, but you do, you go to more of a regression framework. And then there's also model evaluation, which might include thinking about assumptions or thinking about, um, you know, how good the model fits, et cetera. Okay. And again, this, the primarily thing that we teach in introductory statistics is probabilistic models. And so that's that piece that we looked at. And there's always this, you know, tension of complexity, model complexity versus parsimony. And, but the goal in a lot of these probabilistic models is to explain, to explain variability or look at differences or whatever the case may be. Okay. Um, there's another set of models that get used, which are algorithmic in nature. And there we don't build up the structural and, and random part so much as we have a set of rules that define an algorithm. And this algorithm is governing the model. And basically, we have some of the same tensions as we do with probabilistic models, complexity versus parsimony. And a lot of times the goal is um, prediction. In this case, if you want to read more about this, I really strongly suggest this paper by Leo Bryman that was published in Statistical Science. And he talks a lot about this. Now, you can also use these models to explain, and that's probably more so the case now than it ever has been. But um, generally, they were introduced for the idea of prediction. But these aren't introduced in um, statistical courses so often. We in the probabilistic models have to date, and to date being, I don't know, in the last, maybe up to the last 20 years or so, but prevailed in academia and the algorithmic models are more prevalent in, in industry. Well, this kind of set the stage for our research where we were just curious to know if, because algorithmic models usually are not uh, represented very much in academia, um, we wanted to know what what will happen if we present algorithmic models to a group of people who are familiar with probabilistic models? And so our technical research question was here, to what extent can a curated set of professional development activities help secondary statistics teachers appear to understand ideas of model building and evaluation when introduced to or when introduced using classification trees? And kind of to break that down, our sort of sub-research questions were. How do, how do they appear to understand model building and model evaluation when we present them with an algorithmic model? And also, to what extent do ideas of probabilistic modeling appear to sort of conflate their understanding of algorithmic modeling? And again, um, these were just kind of appear to, you know, we were kind of exploring the, what happened. We have this really great opportunity at the University of Minnesota to work with the college in, college in the schools program. And, the way you can think about college in the schools is it's a lot like the AP program where uh, the um, students, high school students can earn college credit for um, in their high schools um, by taking courses that are taught by high school teachers in the high schools. So it's a little different than running start where they're not like leaving their high schools to attend college classes. They're in they're they're situated in their high schools. But the idea is that it's a little different than AP because credit is not awarded based on a high stakes test. Credit is awarded just based on completing assignments and tests the way that they would in a college course. And so we have um, high school teachers that are kind of satellite, basically running these mini satellite campuses around the state. And these teachers are usually high school math teachers. We had 11 that participated in the study. Um, they, like many math teachers, they have minimal prior training in statistics, typically. Um, most of them had a bachelor's or master's degree in math or math education, and some had previously taught AP statistics, so they would have a little bit, probably a little bit more statistics knowledge from that. And most of them had been teaching our college in the school statistics program for one to three years, and that uses the catalyst curriculum for those who are familiar with that. But it was basically a really great opportunity because part of our job doing the college and the schools program is to run professional development for these teachers to keep them current in the discipline and so forth. So we had this opportunity to run professional development that they were basically required to attend and we wanted to take advantage of this chance to explore how they appeared to interact with algorithmic modeling. 
So the next slide shows the professional development that we created for them. Um, we had five days with about two to three hours per day of professional development and assignments. The, assign the lessons were designed based on constructivist frameworks and essentially we designed them for the teachers to work in small groups of two to four on different uh, activities. And those activities were followed by discussion with a large group, including facilitators, um, my, my co-authors and, and the large group discussions. Um, we took video of them working on the activities. We took video of the discussions. We also looked and analyzed data from their actual artifacts from the what they created in the activities. And we also collected data from individual reflections that they completed after completing the activities, um, just asking them to reflect on different aspects that we were hoping they would learn. And the uh, different activities are listed here, and all of these are going to be available at on Andy's GitHub site. They're all available now, but we'll post the link to that at the end if you want to take a closer look at the activities. And on the next few slides, we're just going to talk about what we found at each of the activities. So Andy's, you can yeah. Talk. So again, we had uh, these PDs were situated so that we had three days of PD during the summer, and then there was you know some time off that was had happened at the beginning of August, end of July, and then we had uh, one day in the fall and one day in the spring semesters, and and throughout all of these, we're examining the the data with respect to thinking about. How this, how students or how students, I, I call them students, they're not really students, they're teachers, uh, are think about you know, building and evaluating the models. So in the summer PD, we wanted to introduce algorithmic models through classification trees. And so we did this um, and, and we wanted teachers to be able to make predict predictions from these models. Uh, we also, in order to think, get, start to get at ideas of evaluation, they created these classification tables where they looked at, you know, how many cases were predicted correctly, how many incorrectly, and so on, based on uh, the different predictions. And we introduced a really rudimentary uh, metric for model performance, which was just classification accuracy. How many cases did you get right? Uh, with your model, and then um, started to begin to evaluate mo the models using that metric. So uh, again, starting to build up these ideas of model building and model evaluation. And what we found is that teachers were able to definitely read a decision tree. So if we present when we presented them with several decision trees, they were able to read through that and take a case follow it through the tree and make a prediction, use the model to make a prediction, okay? So they could definitely use that to classify cases. They were able to read that tree, but model evaluation proved to be pretty, still pretty difficult. So when we asked them, for instance, how good their models were and things like that, um, they, they said some, some amazing things. Um, and here's a, a sample of them, but one of these says, uh, well, it's fairly good since we are erring on the side of the most fatalities. So they wanted to fit a model that had the most fatalities so they could kind of get at a, uh, an optimum. Um, and, you know, here's another one, a model of 73% accuracy, well, better than chance, 50-50, doesn't seem like the best model. So they compared it back to this chance model, which we never, you know, introduced in these activities at all, something that came from their old work. Um, it was an okay model. We would want something in the range of 80 to 90%. So they seem to have this kind of baseline level of what makes a model good, right? And, and maybe that comes, we speculate that might come from using something like P equals 0.05 is always a cutoff. And the second set of professional development, so this is a one day uh, kind of um, Sorry. one day in the fall. Uh, we asked them to build a model. So they were actually, this was their first time they were actually creating um, the models themselves based on data. And we just gave them this one single predictor. There's a dot plot here that shows you uh, the age. This is showing the orange or blue represents whether a person does or does not support a particular political issue. I won't say what issue it was, but we'll just say there's, you know, blue means they do not support and orange means they support the issue. 
And we gave them age as a predictor and we asked them to basically create a classification tree based on these data. And so the tasks they're written on the right, um, we asked them to use the data, not their intu intuition to build a tree that, that will predict whether or not a person, oh, it does say, support same-sex marriage based on their age. Um, so the next slide shows basically what one group did. Initially, they actually just made one cut point right in the middle of the data. I forget where the cut point was, but, and they just had kind of, if they're less than this age, they do support. And if they're greater than this age, they don't support. But Andy, in the transcript, it's kind of fun to see Andy challenged them and said, can you do better? And then they kind of took the challenge and said, oh yeah, we'll show you better. And what they ended up creating here is a very, very complex model that basically runs from left to right across the dot plot, um, changing at any point to be almost as best as they could perfectly classify the cases based on, on, on age. And their misclassification rate was one out of 24 because there was one place in the dot plot where there were orange and blue stacked on top of each other. So it was impossible to get perfect 100% classification rate just based on the age variable. And it was really interesting. I'll just read from the from the transcript of what what they said when the when the group was evaluating this model. Andy said, "Well, you got a darn good misclassification rate, right? And your model predicts really well." And then the the teachers replied. They said, "Well, for right now." And they said, "Except you're going to give us more data, and that's going to be we're going to wish we didn't do that." They meant pointing to this. And so we picked up from the from the data that uh, and from the discussion that they were saying this this might have been a good model for these data, but won't be when you give us more data. And then some one some, one of the teachers added, the rules are very specific to one data set. That doesn't mean they're good. And so we interpreted this as them having some sort of sensitivity to overfit, some sort of sensitivity to the fact that this classification tree may work for these data but won't necessarily predict well for future data and sure enough we did give them more data we gave them 10 more data sets to kind of do perform cross-validation in a sense and they calculated the average error rate and it's on the far right column of the of the image there and sure enough the classification rates were worse when these rules were applied to new data and so they kind of had this overall awareness of overfitting, but then in further discussion, we saw that they had trouble kind of knowing what to do. They, they definitely wanted more data, but in a lot of cases, it sounded like maybe they would merge the data into one giant data set and use that to create a classification tree and maybe not kind of preserve the um, sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the purity of what the training and the validation set should do and would kind of merge them together and stuff like that. So we recognize the sensitivity to overfit, but not necessarily a, a clear, you know, they didn't have necessarily intuitive ideas about what to do with more data if they were to actually have more data. On the third set of PD, we, we, what we decided to do is we wanted them to think about um, kind of the algorithm, the recursive partitioning that kind of the simple cart model uses. And so what we had observed before previously and it also in other research that we've done is that there's something that um, Bill Finzer once referred to as the tyranny of context. And that is that teachers and students get overwhelmed in the context and and don't pay attention to kind of the underlying mathematical or statistical principles for potentially. And, and we saw this like with the Titanic when they were concerned about like, well, we'd wanna predict how many people could be dying so we could send boats, et cetera, instead of just understanding that this was a prediction problem. So in this third set, when we introduced the recursive partitioning, we took away all context. So we just said, this: these are two predictor variables, X1 and X2, and these, you're predicting, you know, are you going to predict a triangle or a circle here? And the I idea was we also wanted them to act like a computer. So to really remove all ideas of, of their intuition and any kind of contextual uh, problems that, that arose. And so we gave them a, a set, something that looked like this, asked them to build their, their kind of tree model again using the partitions. So they were allowed to put on, if you've never seen something like this, you're allowed to either put on horizontal or vertical lines and that's it, 
right? And so if you put a horizontal line at uh, four and a half, right? If you're above four and a half, you might predict triangle. And if you're below, you might predict circle. Now that would probably be a terrible rule, but that's kind of the idea. And then they were, we also gave them additional kind of pictures where they could, you know, that would act as kind of like the validation set where they would then reapply their model, but now they might do something like some pruning. So they could try to prune that off. And then we also had them do things like, think about like, well, does your misclassification go rate go down by a certain amount? And, and if it doesn't, you know, then, then we, we prune the rule, but if it does, then we can keep the rule. And we, we did this from a bottom up. So they got to started to understand that the ordinality of the rules matters, that the order you put them in makes a difference. And so the first one is the most important rule, et cetera. Okay. And, and you can see here are a couple of the trees that, that the different groups created. Um, their initial tree is on the left-hand side for the three different groups and the prune trees are on the right. And so, and they ended up with different trees um, depending on their, their rules. And so what did we learn here is that, you know, that we teachers were able to understand this recursive partitioning and they certainly demonstrated that they could build the decision trees. Um, which also got them to pay more attention to the hierarchy of the rules, which is something they didn't pay attention to in the previous professional developments. Um, they also seem to be able to um, better able to evaluate the individual rules. Um, so they were able to say, yeah, if it improved by so much, then we keep it or you know whatever the case might be. And that seemed to go okay. Um, we were a little surprised that they had all the groups had the exact same instructions. We even gave them the cutoff values for pruning and they all came up with different trees. <laughs> so that was a little bit um, in interesting to us. Um, and what we, when we kind of went back and looked at that, what we realized is that one group actually was using the backward elimination kind of algorithm that we actually wanted them to use and had um, uh, explained in the in the activities, and that was the directions we gave them. But other groups use different methods. So another group used a forward selection strategy, which we didn't include in the activity at all. So we're not we're not really sure where that came from. And then a th a third group used kind of a, a a hybrid where they used the forward selection strategy, but deviated by evaluating the rules in total rather than kind of backward pruning um, in subsequent steps. And so that was, you know, again, just I guess every teacher realizes that students don't always read the directions or follow them or interpret them as you intend. Um, but it was, it was interesting to see. Okay. And so Again, there's a lot more detail in the paper, but this, our kind of take home is that they were able to pick up many aspects of algorithmic modeling related to kind of model building and evaluation. They could read, interpret, create these trees. They, they showed some understanding of overfits. Um, they seem to begin to be able to use kind of training and validation data, although that wasn't 100% uh, coherent to them. Uh, why one would do that, but uh, that's not always coherent to some of our advanced stats students either. So, um, and then, but what we also saw is that some of their notions and ideas related to kind of probabilistic modeling that they work with, especially in statistical inference, got a little bit in the way. So they tended to use absolute standards for measuring how good a model was and evaluating things rather than kind of a, a relative or a baseline um, model. And they also, again, were kind of um, that this tyranny of context that took place and, and that um, we, we, we just couldn't overcome. Um, and, and this has some implications and some, some thoughts about you know, one of the gaze recommendations is to always use real data and always embed things in context. And that's something that we have found not always to be 
the best thing to do. Um, and of course, this research opens up a whole bunch of new questions. Um, uh, we, they, all these teachers had seen probabilistic modeling before. Um, Nicola, I'm sorry, I, you're supposed to do this one. <laughs> you're doing great. <laughs> uh, I'll take the first one. You can take the rest. How about that? Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the, we there was definitely a chronology here, um, but we wondered if algorithmic modeling were introduced earlier before they had seen any probabilistic modeling, how that would have changed things. Um, and and we're, we're unsure, of course. Yeah, and especially just to add on to that, uh, it, at least in my experience, I know that sometimes it's hard to help under, students understand why we would retain the null hypothesis, you know, if, if there isn't strong evidence to reject it, why we kind of default to the more simple model. And so maybe some of these ideas with algorithmic modeling where they sort of had a sense of, you don't want your model to be too complicated if it doesn't need to, they kind of had almost like an intuition for parsimony. Would that experience with algorithmic models help them kind of understand some of those notions that are underlying decisions in, in statistical inference and, and other situations, would it help? Um, we also, uh, we have so many follow-up research questions. We're also wondering how my early introduction to algorithmic modeling conflate or support students' understanding of probabilistic modeling. So one thing that we didn't do in our study is go heavily back to probabilistic modeling and say, now how, we asked some questions in reflection, but we didn't really get a lot of depth in, you know, other than like it helped us calculate percentages and, or, you know, just things like that. But how would this really actually algorithmic modeling help probabilistic modeling or will like minds explode? You know, will it be too difficult? Will there be things that we didn't recognize in this study that would then trip up a, um, a novice understanding of probabilistic modeling or would it help? So we that still remains to be explored. And then also how could educational software be designed to help learners build or explore trees and focus on big ideas? So all of you programmers out there, um, we are really keen to kind of talk about what could software look like that would really reduce some of the computation and maybe even kind of visualize some of the decisions they're making where they're kind of you know deciding um, kind of partitions on, on a scatter plot or something, and then like drawing the model and pruning and, and sort of letting the software do a lot of the calculation for exploring different partitions instead of having to calculate it by hand. And, and to what, what kind of scaffolding could we provide through technology um, to really help kind of build on the main ideas instead of getting stuck in some of the computation and so forth. So we have so many other questions, but those are some that we just wanted to highlight as maybe kind of springboards for discussion with this group. And then the next slide, Andy's just gonna show in case anybody wants to take a screenshot of our references. And, but oh, this one's really, sure. that's fine. <laughs> but this one, um, hopefully you're quick on your, on your keys, but the next slide has our, um, uh, email addresses, but also perhaps most importantly, Andy's GitHub site where you can find the um, PD activities that we gave the teachers. And we'd love to hear feedback or just to have any input and open that up um, to con continue to move this research forward um, if folks want to build on it and so forth. So um, that GitHub site is also something we wanted to share. Great. Well, Nicola and Andy, kudos for a just fabulous talk. I'm really uh, impressed and appreciative. Um, I, we do have some time now for some conversation and discussion. So please add your questions to the chat or the Q&A. Um, when I first saw this paper, I was really excited about it for a number of reasons. Um, you're getting people to think about making decisions. You're getting people to think about making errors to understand this aspect of, of the decision-making isn't gonna be perfect. You're getting them starting to think about the trade-offs between complexity and accuracy, right? You eventually can distill it down to a two by two table of how they did in terms of what their decision was. And again, these are all kind of fundamental things that dovetail very well with the mathematics. You know, when we start seeing two by two tables, 
uh, early on, as well as the growth that's been happening in, in, in a number of different areas. So I think your questions are really exciting. I think the paper is fabulous. I did have a couple of questions that I'm going to start off with um, before um, we, we turn to the attendees. I'll take my moderator privilege there. Um, the AI for K-12 learning progressions. Um, I know you've both seen those um, to, to, to some extent, and I've just put, put the link in there. You know, it's pretty interesting um, that uh, big idea number one and three um, that, you know, that really talk about how in kindergarten through two, grades three to five, six to eight, nine to 12, you could be thinking about, you know, doing AI. And they, they you know, that's a pretty audacious kind of approach that, that they're taking. But I think this dovetails really well with it. And that question, you, you posed the question, when earlier in K-12, like, you know, right now, for the most part, this is not showing up as part of the common core mathematics. It is showing up in certain areas in computation, but as we all know, it's been, you know, 25 years since the AP statistics curriculum was tweaked and it's not really part of those conversations either. I'd be really interested in your thoughts about where this could be built upon how it could tie in with science education, math education, computing education, um, and how we could kind of build this scaffold. Great question, Nick. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad Nicola's here to take that one. <laughs> I mean, our, our study was high school teachers, right? And um, like, and, you know, like Andy talked about, they picked up really quickly on reading decision trees using them to make predictions and then comparing that to reality. So to kind of, um, they could almost like literacy, like like uh, kind of, they handled the literacy fine with decisions. Yep, yep, yep. And so that suggests that some of that stuff maybe could go earlier, right? That these, you know, that maybe students, you know, with less experience than these teachers could handle that stuff earlier. Um, also, there's some evidence, you know, that this is, computational thinking and that computational thinking has other advantages like being more um, you know opening stem to a broader more diverse audience and so forth so there are other motivations for bringing it in too um, not just whether it would kind of help with probabilistic modeling um, but then uh, you know even our high school teachers that have you know, a pretty good understanding, at least of introductory statistics, they've been teaching it for one to three years, they still struggled with some of the pruning um, aspects and so forth. So I would maybe exercise caution, but again, that could be just, this is just one study with some PD activities. Maybe our, another one of our research questions or follow-up questions would be, how could our activities have been revised, you know, now that we've learned all this to maybe set them up for more success. So um, it just seems like there's a lot of movement in um, recommending this type of stuff to be done earlier and not a lot of research of what is what would happen <laughs> yeah 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 and, and so there's a lot of questions still out there about you know if it, will it help will it make things actually that we don't realize become more confusing um when we try to come back to the statistical inference um and so forth. So certainly with literacy, kind of reading and making decisions based on trees, classifying and calculating the accuracy rates, I think that stuff was so accessible to this group that I, I wouldn't hesitate to try it with a younger audience or a more novice audience. But some of these things about, uh, you know, evaluating the models actually seemed to maybe cause some trouble. And also the whole, Andy touched on this, but the tyranny of context, we have transcripts of teachers we had one example, they were looking at Titanic data, you know, based on their different demographic information and what type first class, second class, third class ticket, predicting, using trees to predict whether they died or survived. And um, some of the teachers spent lots of time with a model trying to figure out why it would be this way. So why would it be women? You know, why would there be gen? Oh, because women got on the boats first. And then why would it be third class ticket? Oh, because they were stuck, you know, and so they had these whole kind of stories about why the model would have chosen, um, why the model would have been, you know, why the model would be this way um, and really getting stuck in the context. And like one, one teacher even said to his group, who cares? We just care about whether it predicts correctly. And so I would also caution with kind of what Andy said about 
including context, you might get students that are looking at models and trying to use it to tell a story, which is fine if that's, you know, one of your goals, but it might also derail them from, from the actual point, which is to use models to evaluate or to evaluate their accuracy. And so, and I, I'll follow up on that too, Nick, sorry to interrupt you there, Nicola, at the end, um, yeah. which I think is, I think it could be introduced really early. And, and, and for the simple reason that this is a dichotomous sorting algorithm. And I think that that is fairly intuitive, even to a young child. Um, and you could start early on thinking about like, you know, and you could have different kids create models to sort, you know, how do I tell whether someone's wearing a blue shirt today? Right. And, and can I ask yes or no question? Oh, you can only ask yes or no questions. I mean, they play these games as kids. Um, and so, and then really rudimentary, I think, measures of model complexity. Let's count how many rules there are or how many nodes, right? Once we make the tree or whatever. And so I think you could start to make some comparisons. What, what struck me, I think, is that I like this much better as a way of introducing ideas of model evaluation and model building than what we typically do. Because we don't typically get into that until you, again, get into a re, like a regression course where you're building and evaluating models. And I think, you know, another way to fix, maybe, I don't know, fix the problem, probably introduce a whole bunch of other problems, but would be to just do away with our traditional system of inference and, and start introducing regression right at the get-go and instead of separating it into t-tests and ANOVAs yeah, and you yeah, know yeah yeah no and again I'm 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 with you in that regard I think that the, you saw from the paper that the teachers were into it that they really didn't require any particular background but it was it was hard to kind of start to pull that together and you found gaps in their understanding and so you know this is these are you could argue it's a threshold concept. I'm, I'm not necessarily doing that right now, but but I think understanding this area, and Andy, your point in particular there about how this lets us start to think about model assessment in a in a pretty clear way is 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 really good because it makes it kind of very directly seeing what your errors are, and I think that would potentially build to a regression or root mean squared error or other kinds of kinds of things. We have a couple. Go ahead, Nicola. Yeah, one thing that we didn't really focus on much in this talk or in our paper is that it was, there was a lot of multivariate reasoning going on, you know, with the Titanic, we were having, you know, we were having them work with models that basically had interactions, right? The, the effect of this depends on this other, you know, output and so forth. So the way that they were able to handle multivariate reasoning through this context, rather than, you know, other maybe possibly more complex or three-dimensional plots and so forth is also maybe another suggestion that there could be an advantage to introducing it earlier. Yeah, and, and again, you see how you could build to that in your two-dimensional scatter plot and then to kind of get to, to more complicated things. And as you know, multivariate thinking is, I think, the thing that we can really bring uh, together, both on the computational and statistical front. There is a question about error rates. Um, did you ask the teachers before building the model what they thought a good model might be able to achieve in, insure, in terms of an error rate? So that was really interesting because some of the teachers um, kind of had these preconceived notions. Like a lot of times they'd be like 80% uh, accuracy. So it's like a B minus, you know, and they kind of had these kind of um, standards and some of them even compared to like 0 0.05, like that, lo that level of, you know, statistical significance. Um, and so forth, which we hadn't talked about p-values at all in, in these activities. Like the, so um, we were kind of sensitive to that too, using Fisher's rule of thumb um, for level. So they, they had these kind of standards. And there was one teacher who had worked in industry and he was actually like, well, I think this model actually is pretty good. You know, it had like a 70% accuracy or something. He's like, I would want to know if there's another model that does any better. And this, this one who had experience in industry kind of was a lot happier than these other teachers that maybe didn't have as much experience with the industry. So with the error rates, they really had a, an absolute standard rather than comparing to other models and saying, well, this is the best we can do. So this will be good. They really naturally, they adapted really easily to the to calculating the error rates like they had no trouble with creating classification tables and 
and calculating how well each model did and comparing it. And like Andy said, also comparing complexity and they kind of recognize that tension. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. That's great. So there was a kind of a related question about that, about you know, uh, consideration of positive predictive value, negative predictive value for those two different kinds of errors and measuring how good the model is. And obviously this relates really directly to the prevalence of each option to be classified. I've seen some progressions where first model is very much like the nice one you have. And the next one is trying to kind of discriminate a rare disease or something um, where, you know, your best thing is saying you don't have it. You can get 99% accurate, but it's, it's useless as a model. Right. Um, any thoughts on that kind of things and how they, whether they were starting to move in that direction of which of two different types of errors? Well, we, you know, that came up right away because our first context in the, first PD was about classifying emails based on their subject lines as spam or not spam. And so they that came up kind of naturally in those discussions, because what happens if you classify something as spam that isn't. And so they they did start to train, you know, their models trained to fit one type of error better and things like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, it did come up later too, again, in the Titanic, because they were so focused on context again, like, well, what if we say someone's dead and they're not, maybe a lifeboat, you know, wouldn't be sent or, or so on. And so I, it, it, again, it's, I think it's a, a fine line between you want, you want people to start acknowledging that for sure. But if you do it too early, then it gets in the way. Great. Um, there's a question. Um, um, from Ethan. Thank you, Ethan. Have you looked into using CODAP for these classification trees and, and yeah. would these, you know, be, be more useful for these kind of activities? Um, there's a paper that yeah, Tim Tim's. and, and crew have, uh, yep. uh, Joachim, um, Tim and Laura had done, um, uh, from ICOTS 2010. Uh, any thoughts on that aspect of CODAP? So I think it was fine. We, we did not use it at all. Um, we, couldn't make it work. So like the, it's it's changed. Tim has updated it based on ideas from this paper actually more recently. But when we were doing the research, you couldn't load your own data into there. You couldn't, I mean, it was really, and it was really only did certain things that he had intended it to do to work with the work they were doing in that paper. And so there was a lot more we wanted it to be able to do than was able to uh, for it to be done. And uh, none of us are JavaScript programmers. So we just, and, and Tim didn't have the time at the time to update it. So we said, no, we, we're not going to use that. But I think it's better now and probably could be implemented. If you, um, I don't know if he's fixed the, you can bring your own data in, that would be a really big deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's another question. Did the participants in the uh, professional development sessions were recognize these as as different models than what they might be used to or or did you start off the sessions saying look this is different um the the writer asked uh you know is curious about how the conversation might have played out differently if you started off without highlighting those differences between the statistical and the algorithmic models i don't recall a actually highlighting it at the beginning we did have some follow-up conversations when we wrap up the pds and i know that came up a couple of times uh, and in fact they had um one of the homeworks i think asked them to actually do some compare contrast between the types of models that they fit with in tinker plots in the in the catalyst curriculum um, and and some of these yeah, I think the reflections we were kind of hoping for them to kind of reflect back on how does this apply and we were hoping for um, you know, or how does this apply to, to what we teach in the catalyst curriculum, which is probabilistic modeling. And um, a lot of we were a little bit disappointed actually a lot of the responses were very kind of um, rustic, you know, kind of we're calculating percentages or things that weren't very, you know, we really, there was, there's one who actually is the computer science, she teaches AP computer science teacher. Um, she kind of hit on some stuff that was to do with this tension between complexity and, parsim and, and parsimony and the accuracy. So she kind of talked about like, at what point do you kind of say that this, you know, trade in the complexity for the accuracy and, 
and kind of talked about that and related it loosely back to the catalyst curriculum and, and to hypothesis testing. Um, but a lot of the connections were not what we were hoping for, um, especially with the model building, the model evaluation, and some of the big ideas that we were we were hoping that they would connect back. And maybe that after some scaffolding and some larger group discussion, maybe that would have been more clear to them. But from the data we gathered, which admittedly didn't focus a lot on now, how does this translate back? Um, so that's something that could be explored further for sure. Okay. Um, well, one last question we have time for. Um, uh, someone notes, you know, to deal with the tyranny of context, which I think, by the way, we need some papers talking more about the tyranny of context, because we've certainly gotten the sense of context is critical, but at what point does it get in the way? But that's my editorializing. Um, so the, you know, the question writer does an activity in the class where students graph data sets without context and try to match them to the original question. Um, you know, is there a way to adapt that kind of approach to this activity that you can think of? I think it wouldn't hurt, you know, if like the activity in the end when we did X1 and X2 and didn't give them a name and then say, okay, now let's think about what this could be. That also, from my very limited understanding of the field of computer science and AI right now is kind of um, my computer science friends he, who does AI for a living, he said that they're starting to do more explanation after they get a good a predictive model. And so they'll look back at the model and see if they can get any explanation from it. So that kind of reflect, reflective looking back and seeing if you can make connections after the fact um, might be, you know, somewhat consistent with, with practice um, as it has evolved. Um, but I, I still think, I think, and Bob's written some stuff about tyranny of context, context right, Andy? Is there already stuff that he's seen yeah, in the past? Yeah, it's, it's kind of all related. A lot of our work, in, like their work, uh, Joan and Bob's work in sa on sampling sim, they took away all context uh, mm -hmm. in explaining like the central limit theorem because we realized that got in the road. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think the idea of what I think in reflection in our group, we would have probably done the contextless example first if we were going to reorder things. Because I think, you know, and again, that helped them focus on the algorithm. It also got them to think like a computer. And so that idea of think like a computer, I mean, that's hard to describe in some ways, right? But they all, they all kind of, they're used to us saying it from time to time. So they, uh, in our community, they kind of understood that, but, you know, if they start with that and then move into, um, the, the context uh, situation with context, then maybe they would be more apt, but we, we right. didn't, unfortunately didn't do that. So we don't know. <laughs> well, unfortunately we're, we've run out of time. Um, but again, I want to thank you for writing a great paper that I think is in a really interesting and important area. I think there's an incredible amount of work doing to bring Ryman's vision and critique from 20 years ago, how we're kind of thinking about integrating that, because I think that statistics has certainly broadened into these aspects of predictive analytics, but we needed to be doing a lot more research and a lot more work in this, and I think this helps us move us along that way. Um, please go ahead and save the chat if you want. It's available, I think, for you to grab it. There's some great links. We will be posting the slides as well as uh, the video in the next couple of days. But I just want to thank our speakers um, and to the other co-authors for a great paper. And thanks for participating in this month's CAUSE JSTSE webinar. Have a good day. Thank you.